nine, eight, seven, six. Go for main engine start. Main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Welcome to the Orbital Perspective Podcast, where we dolly zoom out to a perspective where upcoming megatrends become visible. Every day, it is more and more apparent that we are in the midst of the great transition. Everything is changing rapidly. The fundamentals of business, government, and society are being rewritten almost on a daily basis. We are truly living during a time where the riskiest course of action is to stay the course. The most hazardous path is to take the tried and true. We are also living during a time where it is becoming more and more apparent that the status quo is not working. At least it's not working for everyone. And until the status quo is working for everyone, we will do nothing more than slap temporary band-aids on our problems and our challenges. We are presently dealing with crisis after crisis. But these crises can serve as a wake-up call. They can be our call to action to incorporate the changes necessary to make us all more resilient and better equipped to deal with the future crises that will undoubtedly come our way. The Orbital Perspective is all about transcending the divisive walls that separate us and embracing the awe and wonder of our shared humanity. What all the guests on the Orbital Perspective podcast have in common is they are all able to see things from a slightly different perspective. And when we look at issues from different perspectives, we see things in stereoscopic vision. Multiple perspectives allow us to see the depth of a situation below the two-dimensional us-versus-them surface. The other thing all our guests have in common is that they are all proof that you don't have to be in orbit to have the orbital perspective. Now, this is not an interview, and it's also not just a conversation between two friends. It's a conversation amongst all of us. If you're listening live, please post your questions and your comments so that we can bring you into the conversation. And if you're listening to the recorded conversation, still please join in with your comments and questions and be a part of this evolving community. Thank you for being here and being a part of this conversation from the Orbital Perspective. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Orbital Perspective podcast. I hope this episode find, finds everybody safe and, and healthy and navigating the new world we find ourselves in in 2020. So, you know, the kind of the tagline of this podcast is uh, from space, it's obvious that everything is changing. And we are in the midst of a big change right now. We are days away uh, from a national election here in the U.S. Um, I don't need to tell all of you that are tuning in from the U.S. that. Um, and, you know, this time next week, um, we're going to have to deal with the aftermath of that election, an election where um, potentially half the country is uh, not very happy with the outcome. And so this, the podcast, the Orbital Perspective podcast is, is intended to be apolitical. And this is not a, this is not a political podcast. And what I'm about to say might start out sounding a little political, but it, but it really isn't. You know, I have friends that have told me that they can't imagine the country surviving four years of uh, Biden presidency. And I have friends that have told me they can't see the country surviving uh, another four years of a, of a Trump presidency. But I think what's more important than who is elected president is how we, the people, react to who uh, is elected president. Uh, what I don't see our country surviving is uh, the continued trajectory of increasing polarization and, and divisiveness. Uh, you know, the term united we stand, divided we fall, I, I don't think has been truer or seemingly truer than it, than it is right now. And, you know, as we approach a uh, potentially very polarizing national election, it's, in, it's important to understand that, that no team, no organization, no nation can succeed if we're divided. And my guest today is a world expert on building high performance and very cohesive teams. She's an expert 
in finding ways to excel in challenging and competitive environments. My guest today, Coach Jill Ellis, is a champion. And I am really excited that today we're going to apply her talent and her experience and her wisdom to the current crisis known as 2020. And with that, let me introduce my Jill Ellis, a former Division I All-American soccer player and head coach of the U.S. Women's National Team, is the all-time winningest coach in U.S. soccer history. As the head coach of the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team, she led the team to two World Cup championships and was twice selected as FIFA's World Coach of the Year. She was not only the first coach to win two women's World Cup titles in history, but also the first national team coach since 1938, men's or women's, to have two World Cup titles. With Coach Ellis at the helm, the U.S. women's national team has never lost a World Cup match. During Jill's 12 years as the head coach of UCLA's women's soccer team, the program became one of the winningest programs in college history, including eight Final Four appearances, six consecutive Pac-10 championships, and 248 collegiate wins. After stepping down as the head coach of the women's national soccer team in 2019, Jill made her priority ensuring other women get the same opportunities that she had. Working with the U.S. Soccer Federation, the Jill Ellis Scholarship Fund and She Champions Mentorship Program is developing and empowering a new wave of women in coaching. Everyone, please help me welcome Coach Jill Ellis. Hey, Ron, how are you? Great to be here. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm, I'm really happy that you're here. I really appreciate you taking the time to to speak with us today. Um, and it's, it is a great honor. And um, yeah, so we're in uh, we're in some challenging times. And I know that you've been in, a, in some tough spots uh, throughout your career and you've excelled through those tough spots. Um, so maybe to start out today, we could talk about sport. You know, I know that I've heard you say that sport is a vehicle for change. Uh, sport is also has the potential to become a unifying force. Um, I just I just wanted to hear your insights on on how what you think uh, the power of sports can bring to our, to our current situation. Yeah, I mean, I think first I'll start on a, on a personal level because I think this resonates. Is you know, sport for me, it's been it's been a gift. It's not just a it's not been a just a vocation or a passion. It's actually been a gift. It's been something that's enabled me to make amazing friendships. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've, it's even helped me at some point, uh, you know, my family, uh, you know, through, through a former player, I got introduced to um, an orphanage in Mexico, which is where I got my daughter from. Um, it has been, you know, not just a professional vocation. It's been something that's helped me grow. I was an incredibly shy person when I moved over here way many, many years ago. Um, it helped me find my voice. It, it gave me the courage to, to be an out female. Um, so, so many things have been afforded me because of my involvement with sport that I think that's kind of starting there. And then I think beyond that, I've just seen, I have seen the power of sport. I mean, it's, um, you know, it, it's natural when you're in a competition to see this, this fierce competitive cauldron on the pitch. And then you see people afterwards, you know, embracing, shaking hands. I think there's such a good visual for people to see that you can be fiercely competitive on a pitch and then you can shake hands afterwards you know some of my um you know my biggest nemesis in terms of other coaches in other countries uh they have you know they've become really dear friends of me so i think that's also something that sport showcases that you can be you can be this intense and then you can also have the compassion uh of being you know a, an understanding that you're in this together and i think in terms of just you know you take a sport like like for example soccer i mean it, it it's the global game i mean it's played on almost every you know almost in every country in the world it, it's a it's not just a rallying point. Like I grew up in England and it's incredibly tribal there. And it's, again, it's passion. It's kind of a part of the lifeblood of, of the country, but it's also, you know, it provides opportunities for, you know, Marta came from Brazil, from the streets of Brazil. And now she's, you know, arguably the best female soccer player, you know, of our time. It's, it's been that, uh, that vehicle for her. So there's just so many blessings that I think um, come together from sport and, you know, I think the Olympics stands as one of probably the most uh, glorified um, showcases of cultures and countries and people coming together. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, 
I, it's it's an amazing, amazing vehicle. Yeah, but I, I've, I've heard you say that when you first started in the sport, um, when you first started coaching in the sport, that you saw pretty much everybody as a competitor, right? Mm -hmm. And so so over the course of your time coaching, that that mindset kind of has changed a little bit. And can, can you walk yeah. us through that transformation, that evolution, if you will? Yeah, I think part, part of it is, you know, when you're young and especially, so when I got into coaching, um, there were hardly any females in coaching. It was, um, you know, there wasn't this uh, many role models out there in terms of seeing it all the time. And so I think naturally, you know, not only do you want to prove yourself, uh, you know, with the male counterparts who are in coaching, but then there's very few females. And so I, I really was like, almost like this. I was very defensive. Um, I also think, you know, at the time I was uh, a closeted female and I didn't, you know, I didn't want anything to kind of derail. This was a different time back then, but to derail people's perception of me in terms of my capacity to recruit student athletes. So all in all, I lived in this shell. And I think what, what happened was, you know, as I grew, uh, you know, I realized, so I went from being kind of, I would say an independent coach and pretty demanding, meaning it was, you know, let's do it this way, my way. And I had to be right more than I had to be inclusive. And then gradually you realize, as I think as you gain in confidence and you mature, um, because I was pretty young when I started in coaching, that my goodness, we are much stronger when we're collaborating. Um, the role of a coach is, is more to inspire than, than you know, and, and certainly there's times you demand, but I just realized that there was a better way to be as a coach. And as I did that, I think I started to embrace the fact that the people on the opposite bench, they're living in the same space as me. They understand my role better than anybody else out there. And so now it, it became sort of, um, important to me to kind of get to know those people and connect with them and and the minute I started to like I always like to play against my friends because I knew afterwards there was no hard feelings right but then what I realized is that I like that feeling and so if I could feel that regardless of who was in the other uh, on the other on the other bench um, I'd be better off and I'd be in a better place and so I really tried to um, embrace that and gradually as I've grown um, I think what I've realized, Ron, and, and, and you know this because of the platform that, that you have created, that when you, when you have, get to a position where um, you, know, you have a, a voice, uh, you have a platform, it's important to use your voice. It's important to be visible. And the Jill Ellis 20 years ago wanted to kind of hide in the shadows. And now I recognize that you have a responsibility to, to be um, a force that people say, hey, listen, if I want to do that someday, if, if I could have someone break the records and, and be and have an easier path than I had, that would be the greatest gift of all. Yeah. And, and everybody has a voice and especially you people that are tuning in right now. <laughs> so I want to encourage everybody to, to jump into this conversation, give us your comments and questions and, and, and be a part of it. And Jill, you brought up a couple of really, really good points. And one is the fact that you guys are friends uh, in a in a really competitive environment, and when the competition is over, you're you're still friends. And mm -hmm. I think that is kind of the secret ingredient that's missing right now in a lot of our interactions in society right now, because we're forgetting that we're forgetting the bond that we share as as fellow countrymen or or fellow humans. Uh, as, as being, you know, first and foremost. The other thing that you brought up, you didn't say the word, but I, what I got out of what you were saying is when you went through this evolution of coaching was that you started to embrace humility. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a really good example of that in, in, in your later career is in 2016, when you guys lost the, the quarterfinals in the, in the Summer Olympics in, in, in Rio. And I know that uh, that was probably a wake up call. Um, and I, and I, I remember that that you had had saw that there was some some aspects of the team that could be taken advantage of by other other teams in, in other matches. And so you set out to basically rebuild the team. Um, yeah. And, you, you know, there was a I know that that was probably a very tough journey because, you know, every the other thing that we all suffer for, for suffer from besides the fact that we forget that we're all on the same team is this short-sightedness, right? So we, we want results tomorrow. Um, we're not thinking long-term. And so I know that you had a lot of critics, um, even critics calling for you to be fired because yeah. the things that you put in place were not immediately working, right? Yeah. Um, maybe, can you, can you talk to the, to the aspect of humility? Because I know that you say that it, failure is an opportunity and risk is an opportunity. 
Uh, and so we have a lot of risk right around us right now for folks. And, you know, what I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities out there too. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think what I, you know, what I did realize is that it's, I'm much better with, with people around me. And so it wasn't, you know, I just, I didn't have to be that sole person to, to, to sort of lead. And so I think the, yeah, the reality of what happened in Rio was it was, um, you know, it was the lowest finish ever in, in a world championship. And, you know, it's always feedback when you, when you fail at something, it's, you're getting instant feedback. I mean, you know, we know this, that, that the, when things go wrong, our lens is even more intense generally to find out and to question and to try and probe to, to understand the why. And so what that, you know, what that did was it actually afforded me an opportunity to say, okay, how do we continue to modernize? How do we stay ahead of where we are and continue to try and be trendsetters? And what that gave taught me and that result taught me was you know that change should be a constant state that if we you know if we continue to be static in where we are even daily is on, on our path then you know we're not in this growth growth mindset or growth cycle and um so when i looked at that game and i looked at what we needed it really was about trying to deepen our roster to to bring in you know to your point about your st diversity in terms of profile we needed different types of players you know you you can't have every single player have the same skill set you've got to have this incredible balance um, in terms of attacking, defending, mentality, physical qualities, all those things need to kind of balance out. And so what that time allowed me to do was to really probe um, and, you know, at great cost in terms of, yeah, we lost some games, we experimented, we tried different things. Um, but I think what I learned in that and, you know, going back to the whole idea that you know, when you're going through adversity, it, it is again, you're getting feedback on a daily basis. What I realized is the importance of staying true to what I believed. Uh, you know, reporter was say, are you worried about losing your job? I'm like, I'm not coaching to keep my job. I'm coaching what I believe because that steadfastness and that belief to the, the, the process, I think was was allowed was what allowed us to be successful in 2019. And I think during that process, um, you know, I think as a coach, when you when you have success, when your team has success, you're constantly reminding them, okay, but now we have to go again. You know, now we have to go again. So I think sport, you don't really have much rear view mirror. It's about what's ahead of you. Right. So you can't really dwell in the past. It's about proving yourself. You know, one of our athletes, I heard her recently talk about what's it like to be in the US women's national team because it's an incredibly competitive environment, but they are very good friends. And she said, you know, every single day you have to bring it, every single day you have to prove yourself. And that's humbling. Yeah. You know, when you don't feel that you are, um, you're solid and you're established, you've got to continue to prove yourself and gain confidence from that. Well, I, I've heard you say when you're on the, the top of the mountain, your competition becomes yourself, right? Yes. The, air is, the air is thin up there. Right. <laughs> and, you know about that. <laughs> thin air. <laughs> yeah. So it's a small space there on the on the top, and it's and it's uh, and the air is thin. So mm -hmm. um, we do have a question from Angelo. Let me pop that up there. It says. Uh, how did you deal with the virus disease issue? So I, I, I know that you're still connected with uh, U.S. soccer. I think that uh, means now. How are they? How are they dealing with it now? Um, with the teams, can you speak to that at all? How how U.S. soccer is dealing with COVID? Yeah, I mean, um, they they've uh, you know obviously everything got shut down and they just had their first camp. So international competitions of of still you know in our region, the Concacaf region, have still been shut down, but the team is in camp right now. And, you know, the beauty of being a part of this environment and this organization is, you know, the, the resources they have in terms of the, the medical, the protocols, all the things that they put into play. So the players are back training. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of stringent, stringent rules in terms of, you know, you see it with the NBA, with all these other you know, uh, organizations that are, have been playing very stringent rules. But, you know, I think one of the challenges <clears throat> and, um, you know, this was even a little bit of a challenge because my team wasn't a team that was together all the time. It's basically an all-star all team. So that that concept of staying connected even though you're remote was something that was very, uh, very common to, to my job because this wasn't a club team that I saw every week. It was a team we got together once every couple of months, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, what it, what it speaks to is that in, you know, what people are dealing with today, that connection, you know, I've said that's kind of the root of, of being a coach is the connections you establish. Well, now you've got to do those remotely. And so I think what's important is that you not only speak to the team at times as a whole, but you also create that one-on-one -on -one time. I think that's essential, um, you know, where it's just you and another player, because 
And I think I spoke to this about one time before, Ron, is the world we've come from is this constant back and forth. You know, it's it's conversation, it's listening, it's questioning, it's answering, it's dialogue. But when you're at home and you're sometimes isolated, you don't have that natural back and forth. And so I think that's we crave that as human beings. And I think that's important for us to make sure that we build out these connections. And especially as a coach, reaching out to your shyest player is as important as reaching out to your 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 extrovert during these times. Well, I've I've heard I've heard you quote a Navy SEAL friend of yours saying, you know, hold fast and and stay true. And so I want to put you on the spot for a second. Okay. So, so we're, let's just let's just imagine that everybody watching is your is is on your team, right? And we've we've lost a, a bunch of matches. Um, there's no <laughs> there's no end in sight. Uh, ah. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but you know we're you know we have folks out there, um, many many folks out there that you know haven't seen their loved ones in, in months on ends that that are, that have lost their jobs that are battling you know physical ailments. Uh, you know in some cases battling COVID. Uh, people who have lost their loved ones in, in, in terrible situations where they couldn't be with them. And so, you know, people are hurting right now. We, yeah. we're, uh, we're, I mean, you could kind of equate it to being a, a losing team. Um, yeah. So we're in the locker room. <laughs> right. right. Now. What, would, yeah. what would you say? To you, what would you say to your team? Well, I think what's important is that there is, you know, after a tough loss or after this, what you're going through, I think it's important to grieve. You know, if it, it's important to recognize where you are and acknowledge where you are. And you don't have to, you know, we have this term in, in, in the U.S., candy coat things and pretend. You have to deal with the reality of what you're, you're, you're facing. But one of the things I said to my players after that tough loss is that there is another game to play, meaning there is a future beyond what's in front of us. You know, people talk a lot about resilience and how managing and dealing with hard times. I like to talk about persistence because that to me is dealing with the hardship, the heartache, the, the economic struggle. It's, it's in that moment dealing with it, but knowing that you're going to get to a better space, better place. Like that's, it's persisting through the struggle. Like I was asked all the time by parents, you know, how does my kid make a national team? And instead of sort of saying, you know, they got to dream big, which there's an element of that, right? There's an element, I'm sure you dreamed about being in the stars, but there's also pushing through the struggle. Right. And, you know, I think that's, that's really the message and making sure and, and, and encouraging them. This is one of the things I said to a group the other day is, you're not alone. You know, it might feel at times that you are, but you are not alone. There are so many people that were in this together. You know, one of the things I loved when I heard you speak is from, I don't know how far the atmosphere is up there, how many mile, thousands of miles it is, but everybody's part of the human race. Like, I love that because that connection, um, that sense that we aren't alone, that there are people dealing with it. And then, it, and then it's the question of, you know, I used to say to my players, don't come to me and say, why aren't you playing with me, playing me? And why is this player playing ahead of me? Come to me with, here's what I feel. How can I be better? And I think that's an important message, too, in these times is what can I do to help, you know, help these people? Because there are some of us that are, are more fortunate, you know, in terms of our situation, whether it's an economic situation, whether it's a health situation. So how can we how can we remind ourselves that we are part of a team whether it's our family, whether it's our community, whether it's our you know city, we are part of a bigger team. And how can I embrace that role? You know, one of the things, Ron, I think you've heard me talk about this is we would have our starting 11 of our team in the World Cup. But the, the probably the more important players were the players that came off the bench. We called them game changers. We didn't call them substitutes. We called them game changers. And so that's kind of really the challenge for us right now is the people that are going to come in, how can we be game changers to come and help others in our community? Um, and I think there's a multitude of ways. And then I think also if you're struggling, that sense of giving also, I think you'll feel that reward and it will maybe strengthen you and lift you. So I, I heard three, three key themes there. I heard humility, I, I heard perseverance, and I heard unity um, through, mm -hmm. through, through that. And I, th I think, I mean, that's that pretty much sums it up right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, perseverance, you know, we, we need to persevere through this. And and those people who are successful are the ones that persevere when it's not fun, when they don't think they're going to be successful, when they don't think it's going to be worth the effort. The ones that, that push through that are, are the ones that are successful uh, th when they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, which is which is kind of where we're at right now. Um, but I, I think the unity part is, is also really, really important. And I think, you know, a lot of the suffering in the world, if not all the suffering in the world, 
is in the gap between who we are and who we think we are. You know, we, we think yeah. we're these individual uh, things called people when, when actually, which is true, but we're also part of a bigger, a bigger cosmic journey where there's a unity there that we don't recognize. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's a, that, that's an important aspect of it. The other thing is that we, you know, your, your team, you have paid a, a, a price for the victories that you had. Your team has paid a price. Uh, what we're going through right now, we're paying a price, whether we get something out of it or not. And yeah. you said that this, you know, we have a lot of opportunities in, in front of us. And so we need to look for those, those ways to get um, benefit from the price that we're already paying. We need to look for ways yeah. to come out of this crisis, you know, stronger, more unified. And in the opening, you know, I talked about the fact that in a few days, we're going to have a national election here. And what I pledge to do, and I hope everybody pledges to do this, is no matter what the results of, of that election are, that we become white blood cells, right? Right. <laughs> white blood cells in the immune response to heal our, our nation and our world. And that is about finding common ground, finding things that we can work on together. Uh, and I think a really good example of that is the International Space Station. You know, we you know, there are 15 nations that built that that space station. Some of them weren't always the best of friends. We had big problems with, with some of these uh, former uh, enemies, and but we found the common ground. And if you find the common ground, you know, relationships develop, a, a certain level of trust develops, and then you can use that as a platform to potentially address the things that, that you don't agree on. But we're so focused on the things that we don't agree on. And as a coach, you know, can you maybe speak a little bit about times where your teams have kind of uh, had some divisive streaks in them and, and ways that you had to, you know, bring them back together? Yeah, you know, I think the the cool thing about a team is, you know, like I always say this is what's easier than, than for, for, for people in business, so to speak, because for us, our endpoint is very clear. Like sometimes you're trying to figure out what your destination is. And for, for us with the U.S. women's team, it was we wanted to be on top of the podium. So the endpoint was was very real. And so it was not very tangible, that. right? I mean, yeah. And then, but so now it was, you know, when you have a common goal, when you have something that you're kind of rallying behind, I think what's important as a coach at times is to remind them that, you know, they understand they can't do it by themselves, meaning it can't just be about one player, it has to be about the collective. Um, but there's also, you know, uh, showcasing that. So, for example, you know, I knew when we, I knew we had a, a good chance of winning this 2019 World Cup when we went through this period where the trust was evident. And what I mean by that is sometimes as a coach, you know, you put up you put up some video and, you know, maybe it's a player not not doing the right thing or making the right decision or whatever. And sometimes players struggle to kind of see that and deal with the fact that they're either, you know, being called out in front of the group. And that's not the purpose of why you do it. You're doing it to showcase, hey, we're all learning, we're all in this together. So when I would put up video clips, it was never saying, you know, let's not focus on who this is, let's focus on the situation that we can learn from. And I knew we were gonna be a really good team when I could show a, a clip of our goal we've had been scored against us. And players started to talk about their responsibility in that goal that we've just given up. You know, it's the forwards talking about, I could have done this, it's the midfield of this. So generally when a goal goes in, people focus on either the defender or the goalkeeper, but it was the collective responsibility and accountability. And I knew when we got to that point in those film sessions where players actively spoke up about what they could do, uh, and even to the point where they could have a communication with another person in the room saying, hey, I think you could have done this. And the person's like, yeah, that's when you know you've got a very um, united team. And so did we did we deal with different situations? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you put a group of, a group of people together and there was almost 50 people in our party, players and staff, it's never going to be harmonious 100 percent of the time. But the things that we we talked about is can we find a common ground? Do we, do we have the trust that we know we have each other's back so we can have these open, hard conversations? And generally what I do, you know, I did was if, if there was something where it was, you know, between players or even between staff, it's like, let's see if they can solve it first. Mm -hmm. And then if I need to kind of step in and we need to have sort of some mitigation. So it's really, you know, to your point, it's letting people connect to, to other people. The people with the differences being able to sit down in a calm space and say, let's talk this through. And you know, one of the things I, I tried to encourage was always looking through somebody else's lens. So for example, instead of showing the clip through the goalkeeper's lens, I would say, let's look at this through this person's lens and now you can maybe have a better understanding. Even to the point, Ron, sometimes in training, 
a player would play a different position because we needed them to, and they'd come out and they'd be like, oh man, now I understand what that person was dealing with, right? You don't experience right. that until right. you're in that person's space and dealing with those situations. And then collectively that gave us a better, much better sense of, of having this, this synergy uh, on the field. You know, I, I think we've had this, I think we've had this conversation before. I don't think we put it in these words, but what, what I heard you say um, is that, you know, part of the strength that comes from diversity is having a diverse, diverse set of perspectives, right? And that's, that's kind of why I wanted to call this, this podcast, the orbital perspective, because part of what the orbital perspective is, is you're changing your perspective at five miles a second, right? And when we, and when we can see things from, from at least two different perspectives, we see things in stereoscopic vision, right? When multiple perspectives, multiple, multiple angles, multiple vantage points allows us to see the depth of a situation, right? The true, the true nature of a situation, of a problem, of, of a, of a challenge. And so, our greatest strength right now is our greatest weakness, right? Our greatest strength is we ha we ha are a very di diverse people that have diverse um, point points of view, right? <laughs> Do have diverse vantage points. That could be a source of incredible strength if we allow it. But you you've said this over and over again. In order to incorporate those perspectives, we have to have the hum humility to realize that we don't have all the answer. That our perspective is not the only perspective that exists, it's not the only true perspective that we have to have to bring that in there. And you also talked about uh, taking personal responsibility. And, mm -hmm. and so part of that perspective is, you know, not just pointing fingers at folks and saying this, you know, trying to point responsibility towards other people, but putting responsibility um, where appropriate on ourselves. And, and a, a quote from Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu comes to mind. And he says, we cannot succeed by denying what exists. The acceptance of reality is the only true place from which change can begin, and I think, I think that's really important. And I think that's what your players were doing when they were when they were owning up to the fact that they weren't where they were supposed to be or doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were acknowledging reality, and I think I think that's a really good takeaway. Yeah, very much so. So, you guys are out there. I see you. So, join the conversation. <laughs> Give us some questions. Um, you know, maybe. Maybe a good thing that we could talk about right now is is I absolutely love your profile picture on your Facebook page. <laughs> it's just such a, a a joyous photograph. It's a it's a picture of you leaping into the air after obviously yeah. some, some victory and and who's who's catching you? Well, it's a it's my father. It was somebody snapped that picture. It was at UCLA. Um, many, many years ago, and it was an overtime victory. And my parents, you know, my parents, my father had his own business. So he worked, you know, long hours and I, he didn't get to see me play very much when I was playing in college. And anyway, so they made this trip out to UCLA. And so it was, it was just this pure moment of joy, you know, that I just, I just, they, somebody captured it. Um, but, you know, it kind of reminds me just in terms of what, what we're talking about here, Ron, is like, you know, when I, when I stepped down from the, from the, the women's team, one of the messages that I left them with, uh, because I just think this seems appropriate, is that, you know, on this journey, um, you know, we celebrate the highs, but we also need to make sure we appreciate the lows. So this quote I heard was to um, to enjoy the beauty of the ocean. One must appreciate and love both the trough and the crest of the mm -hmm. wave. Mm -hmm. And I love that because, you know, what it says to me and, that, and this is what I basically said to my players is, I'm not going to remember the medals and the, and the results of games, you know, medals get dusty and you know, your memory gets old. Right. But what I'm really going to remember is those moments that truly made me feel. And I qualified that by saying, it's not just the moments that were these, you know, pure moments of joy, like that jumping in my dad's arms. It's all, also the moments that were hard, the moments that, was, that stung because both have that balance in right. terms of making the journey worthwhile. And uh, I think, you know, like I'm, I appreciate both, you know, because I think as, as tough as some of those times were, they made this journey complete. And I think that's something, you know, I think we're, especially when people are struggling, like to your point, but my father was incredibly uh, influential to me. And um, it was just, yeah, it was just a moment of, of pure happiness. What, uh, how about your father? Was he uh, influential in you becoming an astronaut? Um, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny back so I, so I wanted to be an astronaut since July 20th, 1969, right? Okay, <laughs> me, me and a whole bunch of other 
uh, millions of, of, of probably boys right. at the time and a few girls, because back then, you know, it was not realistic for a girl to want to be an astronaut back in 1969. Uh, I'm glad and uh, very thankful that that has changed. Uh, it still has a long way to go. Um, but I remember as a kid, you know, I had this dream that I was going to be an astronaut. And I remember um, the inevitable question from grownups, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would always say, I'd always tell the truth. I want to be an astronaut. That would normally lead to a pat on the head and a follow-up question. Um, okay, well, what what do you want to be if you can't do that? What's your what's your backup? <laughs> because it was you know it was such an impossible dream. Um, but I you know I, I I resonate so well with with what you were saying about the 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 highs and the lows because you know all those really tough times that you've been through, all the tough times that I've been through, all the tough times that everybody has been through has made us what we are. It's 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 where our strength comes from, right? And um, we have, and and I love your your quote about how risk and, and failure is is an opportunity because we have a lot of challenge right now that can be opportunity, and, and so we ha we need to figure out ways to transmute that, transmute this this hardship and 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 frankly for suffering that we're going through right now into into uh, benefits down down the road. And so, um, is there any any advice that you would give players like you know? I'm sure you've had players that have got injured. I'm sure you've had players um, that, you know, were so discouraged that they, they contemplating, you know, qu quitting the sport or quitting the team. You know, how, what, are, what are some of the pep talks that, that you've, uh, I, I guess that's a, not a good term, but you don't know. No, no, it's, um, you know, one of the things after, after 2016, when I, when I decided to kind of, you know, um, deepen our roster, I brought in a lot of younger players or, and a lot of players that didn't have a lot of experience. And one of the things I did, interesting enough, right off the bat was I was I told those players, go and sit with the veterans and listen to their scars. Because, you know, I have a, I have a young daughter and social media and the way the world is today. We generally see people in this perfect space. Right. You know, looking looking great on their on their Instagram and and uber successful. But the reality is we've talked about it takes it, there's sometimes a grind and there's sacrifice to get to that point. So it was important for our for our players, young players to come in and sit with Megan Rapino and hear that she had three ACL injuries to overcome. I mean, three injuries, significant injuries. Some people don't come back from one. She came back from three. It was knowing that Alex Morgan had been on the bench in 2011 as a super sub. And it wasn't like she just joined the team and immediately was this, you know, this superstar. So there, there's this journey that a lot of people don't see this grind that, uh, you know, I think it's, it's equally as important. So that was generally what I would say to the young players is go and listen and get the reality, what we talk about, the reality check on, on what it is. And, you know, one of the things you, you'd say to a young player when they come in is you have a special skill set. I think this is important because sometimes when young players come into an environment, they can defer or they can kind of just be a little bit of an awe and intimidated by what's around them. And they kind of lose, lose sight of what makes them special. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I would say in, in my first meetings with them is you've got a special quality that's gotten you through the door. Sh let that shine. Don't try and be something you're, you, you are not right now. You're going to grow, but make sure you're special. So if you love the ball at your feet, want, want the ball at your feet. If you're, you know, a, a phenomenal player in the tackle or in the air, make sure you let that shine because then it's about them owning those qualities. They can add to that for sure. But, you know, those first camps, the most important thing is like get invited back. That's what I tell them. I said, just do enough to get invited back. Um, so I think, you know, that was, I think, you know, as a leader, you, you have to make a little bit of space for those players to, to kind of settle in and find their way. But letting them know that it's it's not a the roller coaster isn't this way you know it's just it's up and down um, yeah. in terms of that. So you you had overnight successes that were twenty years in the making, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I mean, you spoke a lot about leadership, and you know, leadership in sports is somewhat self critiquing, right? If you're if you have you know this this chart that has a W on the top and an L on the top, mm -hmm. you have to have you know more numbers in the W than in the L, right? And so. Um, I got a, uh, here's a, here's a tough question from Ann uh, about leadership. Uh, how can we come together when leaders uh, stroke, stoke uh, division and don't acknowledge reality? Do you think it's an individual decision uh, on a one-to-one -one basis? Um, that's a tough question. So. Yeah, take a stab at it, Ron. <laughs> What's that? I said, go ahead, take a stab at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. like, it's not an interview. This is just a conversation. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think. 
I, I think you already said it. I think we all have to take responsibility for our own actions. And that's, and we, we only have responsibility for what we have control over. And so what we have control over is how we, we react to any situation that's put in front of us. Do we nudge ourselves and those around us and our society towards a more unifying existence? Or do we, do we jump on the bandwagon and get divisive with everybody else? Um, and I, I personally, I'm, I am somewhat optimistic. I'm, in spite of, the, of how dark things are right now, in spite, in spite of how polarized and divisive things are right now, I see a growing awareness of enough is enough, that we are all in this together. We are one human family. Uh, we do need, there, there is no them, there's only us. Uh, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. And the cor corollary to that, which is harder to, to swallow is what happens by one of us happens by all of us yeah. as well to some extent. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think we all are responsible for our own uh, emotions, our own reactions. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, you know, beyond what we, but beyond what we have control of, we shouldn't waste too much effort on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that even, you know, as we talked about earlier, because you know, I think in answer to Anne's question, I'm just reading it again here is, you know, I think it's, it, there's things that are gonna be influential, but at the end of the day, it's, it, you know, as a leader, like, what are, what are my core values? What do I stand for? And I think that, you know, you can be in this storm, but, you know, generally, you know, what do I want my daughter to see? You know, uh, how do I rationalize this? And so I think my job is sometimes to to help her understand that. But everything for me and decisions that I make and what guides me and my guiding principles are the things that matter, that, that my core values, what I stand for. So for me as a leader, how do I try and lead with truthfulness and empathy? You know, I always try and be very candid, very upfront but also have a, a compassion to understand that my message, you know, to a player that's potentially not going to make a World Cup roster or is going to get cut from a team or whatever, um, that 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 has an effect and that has a, a feeling behind it. So, you know, and again, you know, in terms of your core values, you know, it's it's what do you what do you lean on? Um, and I generally say when people are in really hard situations. So, for example, when and I, and I will relate to this to a soccer game, when our players are in incredibly tough battle. And, you know, the game plan's probably going here and the fans are going crazy. You lean on your core principles. And, you know, as a coach, you make sure the players, so a simple core principle, uh, you know, in, in attack is have space, take space. It sounds simple enough, but if there's space there to take with the dribble or with the pass, take it. And it's a very simple principle. And I relate that back to, you know, myself in terms of when things are challenging around me, it's going back to, okay, what do I value at my core? What's important to me? What's important to showcase to my daughter? Uh, I think that's how we, we navigate this because I, I, I generally believe that at our core, uh, we are compassionate. At our core, we, you know, we, we do believe that connecting, we, we do have you know, values. I think at our core, we all do. I think sometimes people can get side railed by that. So I think it starts by owning it yourself and being true to, to who you are. Yeah, I, I think it also relates to, to what we identify with, right? And, you know, some of the divisive leaders that are around and, and divisive politicians, and it's, it goes beyond politics, uh, divisive pundits, uh, one of the tools of that divisiveness is labeling, right? We label people, we put them in boxes, we put them into categories. And uh, when we do that, that erects walls and cubby holes uh, in this in this framework. Um, but we also do that to ourselves. You know, <laughs> when we identify with uh, a, a particular group or a particular theory or a particular pundit, uh, there's nothing wrong with identifying with it. What, what if it becomes your your if it, as long as as you don't let that define who you will talk to, who you who you work with, you know, it's okay to to relate to it. It's not okay to make that your identity. And so I think one of the problems that we are seeing is that people are identifying with a particular political party, they're identifying with a particular, you know, um, sub party or whatever, you know, <laughs> some theory, some, some economic theory, you know, whatever it is they're identifying with. And it goes back to what you were saying about humility. If that is your identity, if your identity is wrapped up in that political party or whatever, then anything that attacks or anything that, that is contrary to what that political party is trying to do 
is an attack against you personally. It's an attack against your identity. And, and that's what you're seeing people defending. They're, they feel that it's a personal attack against them. Um, it's not just two people having a difference of opinion. It's I'm over here, you're over there, I'm right, you're wrong. I can't acknowledge any, any merit in what you're saying because if I do, you're gonna win, I'm gonna lose. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of the problem that we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, just again, I think back to, you know, navigating a team, you know, I mean, I had 23 All-Stars, you know, what was really important because every single player felt they should be on the pitch, which is exactly how they should feel. But I think one of the key things I just that you picked up, I just heard you say is we we also have to be able to listen, you know, it, to, to understand. It's like we just can't shut things down. We've got to make sure we can listen to, to those around us. Yep. All right, we've got one of the winningest, most amazing coaches in the history of any sport on the on the line here. So jump in here with some questions. Uh, but I want to talk just real quick. You know, you coached elite at you said it was an all-star team. So you have these elite world-class athletes. And I heard I heard your definition of the word elite, and I I, I think it's really interesting. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I believe, um, you know, because usually people think of elite back in the olden days, it's, you know, the wealthy is elite to me is somebody that's constantly looking to grow and evolve. Um, you know, Alex Morgan, in my first meeting with her said, you know, how are you gonna make me better? Like, you know, this is a player that already had achieved a lot. So again, it goes back to your humility, like you've already achieved so much, but yet I still have areas of room to grow. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, that's generally, you know, people that people that want to continue to be one day better, as we used to say, you know, in training, we'd, you know, our staff, we'd be in the van and we'd be driving out to training. And we'd be like, all right, one day better. Um, because it was one day on the field that we felt like we could take steps. And so I think that's, you know, that's how I would characterize um, elites. And I was, you know, very fortunate to be surrounded. And I think then as a leader, you have to make sure that you, you understand that because if you go in there all the time and you say, hey, this is great, where we are, it's perfect. And there's not that little nudge of, hey, we can, we can, we can work on this or we can do this. Then I think they, you know, elites generally, they don't want to be stationary. They don't want to be status quo. They're always, you know, I mean, these crazy people that go climb mountains or get in spaceships, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you're always looking for what's next. Um, but I think that's generally how I, I like to characterize it. And, um, you know, so I, I, my daughter too. I'm like, that's, you know, that's how I see it. So we should all be elites then. Right? I, I think so. I mean, I think most of us are. Yeah. And I think it's a label that's, it's, it's been pigeonholed, as you said earlier, just to, to, to this, because I think it's more caught up in class, you know, because I think that's probably how in the olden days and, and all this, but no, to, elite to me is, a, is, is within it's, a, um, it's a verb, not a noun. <laughs> it doesn't have only negative connotations. Yeah. So, you know, we, we talked about team building. We talked about how we're all in this together. We talked about, you know, unifying. And it's hard to unify. Uh, it's hard to bring unity about when there's so much inequity, right? Mm -hmm. um, when there's so much injustice. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about gender equity, in, in, particularly in sports and particularly in coaching in sports. Uh, I know you've got some some thoughts. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, so just to talk a little, uh, you know, a moment about this. So th this program, so U.S. Soccer, who I work for, were kind enough to honor me with a scholarship um, for coaching education. So people, you know, would we would help co young coaches, young female coaches have this pathway. And the more I thought about it, Ron, is every time I you know, I'm speaking, people would say, you know, why are the numbers, uh, the ratio so off, you know, in terms of where are all the female coaches? Because it seems like it's declining. And, and in some sports and some domains, it is, you know, we've hardly got any women's professional coaches in our country, we, college soccer, you know, the numbers. And I'm not just talking about soccer. So one of the things I just, you know, woke up one day, and this is kind of this idea of like, it's called action. Like, I'm tired of hearing about this. What are we going to do about it? Right. So I went back to U.S. soccer and said, you know, let's let's look at this. Um, where are we? How are we going to raise this money? How are we going to funnel it? So we really looked at all the things that were prohibiting women from either getting into coaching or staying in coaching. It could be everything from, you know, the finances to afford daycare to go away and do their coaching license. It could be it could be the fact that there isn't a natural network that exists because there's so few of us in coaching. So we looked at all these and basically came up with this idea of this the, the fundraising part for the scholarship, but more importantly, I think this creation of uh, a network of mentoring. So the way it fundamentally works is, you know, 30 of the top coaches in the female game 
are, are now assigned, we, we are assigned a mentee. Sorry, dog barking. Uh, we are assigned, <laughs> real life, we're assigned a mentee and we work with them for a year. But, and what that does is, it, you know, it creates these, these networks that, you know, respectfully naturally exist for men because they're usually in the majority, uh, especially white men. There's usually, you know, it's usually the majority. So a natural network exists that doesn't exist for women and especially women of color. So um, building this, this network out is, I think, then, because we, the reality of what we know is generally when someone is looking at hiring someone, they either call someone they know, uh, you know, they, they open a door for someone, and so they create opportunity. So this, this mentoring program, She Champions, and the fundraising, the components together are hopefully going to um, encourage more women, uh, empower more women to, to get into and stay in coaching. Because at the end of the day, if you have someone you can call and talk to openly and be vulnerable on the phone to, someone who's lived it and experienced it, I think generally that's, you know, that's going to be the support network that many of us need. Because the reality in, you know, in, in, in women's sports, yeah, it's the, the, the you know, the pay is, is very um, disproportionate. Um, and, and so it's not just, but it's not just the, the financial barriers. It's the barriers of not having networks and mentorship. And, you know, it, it's, it's part and part, the whole thing. You know, it's interesting on my first flight, my first uh, flight to space was on um, in 2008 on, on uh, space shuttle discovery. And one of my crewmates is, was yeah, it just sounds really cool, by the way. I mean, just, yeah, my first flight. There were a bunch of them. <laughs> one of my, one of my crewmates, who was also an astronaut classmate of mine, was Karen Nyberg. And on the um, on the in one of the press conferences, the pre-launch press conferences, somebody asked Karen, you know, apparently you are the 50th woman to ever fly. I think it was 50. You're the 50th woman to ever fly in space. You know, how does that make you feel? Or, or yeah, so, so, something like that was the question. And she had this like mic drop answer that was, I was still impressed. <laughs> she, 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 she basically said, I'm really looking forward to the time where people stop, stop counting, basically, mm -hmm. where, where it's not a big deal, right? And so with, with that as a segue, can you talk about the, the Jill Ellis uh, Scholarship Fund and the uh, She Champion Mentorship Program? I mean, oh, well, I know you just did, but I mean, yeah. how people can get involved with it and, and how, how people can find out um, about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, we, we launched it probably about a month ago. Um, so it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a format. I mean, really, you know, the, the, the financial piece allows us to, um, we're paying 50% of the cost for, for women to go into these licenses. And the, and the reason why we want to license them, in, in soccer specifically, the licensing program uh, a lot of the jobs, you know, they they have expectations on you need the you know a C license, a B license. So you kind of go through this. It's an education platform, but you go through it. And in that platform, though, is where you where you do you network and you get job opportunities and you get um, you know these licenses to help you uh, apply for jobs. So it's you know it, it's something actually it's interesting, Ron, because you know I get asked a lot. You know how do we how do we change these numbers? And you know one of the things um, you know FIFA takes FIFA is the the governing body for for women's uh, well for men and women's sport uh, football around the world. And one of the things they've actually done, which I like, is they've actually in the under seventeen and under twenty. So in the youth World Cups, so there's the senior World Cup and then there's the youth World Cups. They've actually legislated that there must be a female either head coach or assistant coach on the sideline of every single team. And I love that because sometimes up change doesn't happen naturally. Like sometimes it might need this big push. So I think those are, you know, those are programs out there to try and change this dynamic more um, where we can, because, you know, when I first started out for $6,000 a year as an assistant coach, yeah, was it a career path? Not really. You know, it was, it was a, a bit of a trepidatious jump into something. Your that, mom was very upset that you left. And yeah, she, was, yeah. she was that. a bit mad about that. But the reality was there wasn't a, there wasn't a viable career path. It was just kind of a leap of faith. Right. But now there is, it's a career. And I think one of the things that, you know, I want to try and shine a light on is that, you know, coaching is, it, it's such a noble profession in terms of not, not in a braggadocious way, but in a way that, gosh, you go out there and you're trying to help facilitate people to achieve. I mean, it's, it's such an honorable thing, you know, in terms of the privilege of trying to help someone. Um, so that's why I think, you know, more and more can we shine a light on coaching and especially coaching for women. And if we can get more women in coaching, we know that snowball effect will be more women will want to get into coaching because they can see it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, again, going back to the, the space analogy, the more diversity that you put into a team, the, the stronger the team becomes yeah. because of the, the the diversity in perspectives, right? That is the source of the strength, right? And so, yeah, um, yeah couldn't agree more. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking back, I'm thinking back to January when we first met, we were in, we were in, we were in Switzerland together. Yep. And I remember we had this wonderful conversation. I didn't even know who you are. You were just somebody <laughs> somebody that I was introduced to and I had this wonderful conversation and I just thought, wow, this person is special. I wonder what she does for a living. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. So, no, um, I remember, I remember hearing you talk and I'm like, you know, I mean, because, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's, you don't get to meet people that have been in space very, I mean, you're a pretty rare breed, right? In terms of astronauts. So I remember thinking to myself, God, yeah, you know what? When I was a little kid, I used to think about the stars and you know, that, that sense of, of dreaming, you know, I'm, I'm working with this program. It's called uh, lead Africa. A friend of mine, he's, he's working in uh, Liberia. And I was over there a couple of years ago. And, and one of the things he interviewed me for this, um, for this program. And, and one of the things he said is, tell me about your dreams because you kind of think about to a, to a kid, you know, that's, that's where it all begins. Like, you know, and I think as adults, we tend to, you know, we lose that perspective of dreaming. Um, and I think when I met you, I was like, God, yeah, I remember thinking, God, what would it be like up there? You know, it's just magical. So I was kind of, yeah, I was a little bit tingly to be honest with you. Around <laughs> being, being an astronaut was pretty cool. What's really amazing, if you think about our meeting back in January, is how much the world has changed since then. So this was like, I mean, we had heard that there was this thing called, you know, COVID nineteen yep. in China. You know, it, you know, back in January, it was it was something that could potentially, you know, hit really hard. But you know, yeah. um, I, I I know that I didn't anticipate what was going to happen mm -hmm. um, no. and where we're at. But but again, uh, it comes with opportunity, right? Yeah. It comes with opportunity, um, and I hope that it. it it motivates and inspires people to refuse to go back to the upside down status quo. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I hope that it motivates people to, to overturn some of the, the gross inequities and systemic problems that we have in our society. And I, I really think that this can serve as a catalyst. Um, you know, I'm, in, I'm in Colorado right now, <laughs> like surrounded by wildfires uh, that are, you know, burning hundreds of thousands of acres, if not, uh, not more. And, um, this is 2020. I mean, this is this is crisis after crisis. We've got hurricanes coming down in the Gulf. We've got, you know, obviously all the di divisiveness from the election. We've got coronavirus. We've got all the economic problems that are that are, are are coming about because of all of these things. And so, if there was ever a time to pull together, if there was ever a wake up call or, or call to action, uh, the time is now. So we need more coaches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm. I was, uh, you know, I was just I was talking to a group the other day, and you know the. The reality and what you're saying is because, listen, I, my father, uh, you know, I learned a lot from him. I mean, I don't think you can go into coaching without being an optimist. I don't think you can be a leader without being an optimist because you you have to see that glass half full. Yeah. You know, at times you might look at it and kind of sideways and like, is it? But you have okay. to feel that that's where it is. My father was just the eternal optimist. Like there was always a silver lining, right? And I think, you know, some of the things that I see, even with my daughter, the you know the the creativity of her teachers, uh, the innovation that's, that's that's being spurned from these hard times. You know, from this, you're right. I think from this, not just an acknowledgement of the systemic racism and and the economic, the, um, the the climate and the challenges, all these things, but also I think from it we are going to become. Uh, we're going to be more problem solvers. I, I hope that's that's the way it is because I look at it with my daughter and the, and the teachers are remarkable in what they're managing and dealing with in terms of trying to educate children through a computer. Yeah, adversity uh, breeds innovation, especially when yeah. you're when you're cornered, <laughs> when your back is up against the wall, right? Um, yeah. And I'm sure there's lots of sports analogies that that we could pull from yeah. that, but. Jill, any any closing remarks? We're, we're coming up on the top of the hour. I mean, it went really fast, but is there yeah. any, any words of advice or wisdom that you want to leave everybody? Um, I mean, probably going back to that thing of like, what what can you do? You know, if you if you're capable and able, what can we do? You know, whether it's at the local level and even within a family, you know, in terms of just checking in on people. You know, I think it's sometimes we we do we get so um, insulated and 
you know, concerned with kind of what's around us or we kind of get used to where we're at. And so we, you know, remember when you used to do these Zoom calls with your family and now we're six, seven months in and it becomes, you know, just a little less uh, of a priority. I think it's just remembering that, you know, the human connection at its base, that's what makes a team work. A yeah. team doesn't work unless they have a connection. A society doesn't work unless they have, there's a connection. So how do we, especially when we're cut off from that, how can we naturally try and, uh, and build build those and and help you know i think that's what can we do it's it is it's a call to action if we're capable and able what can we do it is undeniably obvious that we are all in this together it's not a it's not a uh a cliche. It's it's the reality of the world. So I'm going to pop this up one more time. I want I encourage everybody to look at the uh, look up the Jill Ellis um, scholarship uh, program and the and the uh, She Champion mentorship program. Uh, and uh, if you're able to support that, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, and Jill, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for your generosity with with your with sharing your your stories and your wisdom and. Um, and for your optimism and uh, and your positive attitude, and thank you for all the contributions you've you've made to to the world and and to and to sports and particularly uh, women's sports and women coaching. So, thank you, Ron. It's been absolutely my pleasure, and I and I love your platform. It's great. Well, with that, we're going to we're going to close, and um, I hope everybody joins us uh, next week uh, and uh, and it comes along on this journey with us. So, thanks everybody. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us during this conversation from the orbital perspective. And thank you for being a part of an emerging unity on our planet. We are strongest when we are aligned around the truth of our underlying unity. Together, we are unstoppable and can build a positive, restorative future, a future that we would all want to be a part of. Please subscribe to the Orbital Perspective podcast and follow us on social media. Thank you for all that you're doing and all that you will do to help make life on our planet as beautiful as it looks from space.